I remember the MTC and I remember how it almost felt like a dream. It didn't really feel real. I was still trying to transition. But I think when it felt real was whenever I was getting off the airplane and I, I was walking towards my luggage and I saw my mission president with his wife and other and the the APs, the assistants. But I didn't know they were the assist assistants at the time. I, I really had no idea what a mission was. I'm, I'm the first in my family to serve a mission. So I had no idea what to expect. I had no idea how like you organize the mission with like the assistants, the zone leaders, the district leaders. I just remember I was completely, just completely lost. I had no idea what was going on. I think every step I took, I was shaking. And I remember how humid it was in Texas. When you walk out the airplane and you just feel this gust of humidity just hit you. And, um, and it's, uh, it's just a shock that you really wake up and you're like, wow, I'm really on my mission. And I remember what we did after that, we got into a big van, we drove to the mission president's home. It's Texas, so we had brisket with barbecue and uh, mission president had these cool little uh, glass boots that were cups. So kind of like a Texan thing. And, uh, and so it was just, everything was kind of Texas Texas is very Texas. I don't know how to explain it. It's just you could tell it was Texas and there were Texas flags everywhere. Um, I think that afternoon we we met our first companions. Um, or maybe that was the next day. I think that I think that first night we stayed with the assistants in their apartment. So that first night we stayed with the assistants and we just kind of talked, you know, all the new missionaries setting all these expectations saying, oh, I wonder where we're going to go because the mission president showed us a map of the whole of the whole area. And everybody was wanting to go to Fort Worth, which is this, the, 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 the center of the mission. Um, I got assigned to Denton, which is my first area. It's kind of like a little college town, a lot like Provo except hotter and there's two colleges there's UNT and uh, I believe it's TCC so there's a lot of young kids there and uh, the I think one of the things that I remember the most about the mission is that for the first time I really felt like a missionary because in the MTC it was almost like, like I said, it was like a dream. But once I stepped foot in Texas, I really felt like a missionary because it was like you step into the battlefield and you, you, you realize that you have to go talk to these people that are just random strangers you've never talked to before. And I think that's just, that's kind of what I can remember from, from my first day. Oh, one more thing. The assistants, uh, very first thing I saw them do was hand out a Book of Mormon to a random, a random guy at the airport. And I remember how scared I was because I was thinking to myself, did he just like go up and talk to that stranger and give him a Book of Mormon? Like he didn't even like talk to him for five minutes. And I thought it was the most heroic thing in the world because I, I was scared to talk to people. But here's this assistant just giving away his Book of Mormon. And I always thought, oh, it's because he's an assistant. That's why he's the assistant, because he's such a good missionary. But the truth is, is that we can all be good missionaries. I saw junior companions do things that were heroic as well. I saw every, every kind of missionary. You know, no matter who you are, you don't have to be in leadership to be a leader. And, and I remember that from the first day, because from that very first day, I saw that good leadership where someone who who wasn't afraid to share the gospel it was my very first very first impression of another missionary in the field well geographically i i don't know exactly all the cities that are in texas but i know i know where the 
the kind of like the borders are. The top is where Denton is at, is my first area. I started kind of up on the top of my mission. And then I got transferred down to the very bottom, which is Colleen area. It's about a, probably like a four to five hour drive from Denton to Colleen. So in about five hours, you should be able to drive from top to the bottom of the mission. Um, now, the, there is, there's really two missions in, in my mission. It's the Spanish mission and the English mission. The reason I say that is because the work is just so much different. It, I remember looking at the other missionaries who were English missionaries and just feeling like they were in a totally different world. We, everything we did was different. The way we proselyted was different. The, the, the way we taught lessons was different. The language we taught it in was different. So it really was a foreign mission in Texas, which is strange to think about. But uh, although we weren't in Mexico, the culture was Mexican. It was, you know, we, we had Mexican food every day. And we got fed, I don't know, five times a day sometimes. And uh, the people were extremely humble. The, everything about it was, it was foreign, which is one, one more thing that kind of gave me a feeling that it doesn't really matter where you serve, it's how you serve. Because really you are in a different world as a missionary. You're not really in Texas as a, as a resident. You're in Texas as a missionary. So no matter where you go on your mission, like you're always going to feel like you're in a foreign mission because it's not, it's not, it's, you're not living a normal life. So Texas was really interesting because they have interesting culture, even though they, you know, even though they're in America, there's certain places that were just like Mexico entire neighborhoods where everyone that lived there was Hispanic and you could just walk and knock any door and there would be Hispanic so it was it was really interesting that even though you know we have a we had a, a set of Spanish missionaries in area in an area and a set of English missionaries in the exact same area uh, it was like a totally different areas so you really you really felt like you had your own your own mission there actually is a book written, uh, I believe it's called When the Saints Came Marching In. And it was written about the first people who came to Texas and it was actually in Denton, in my first area. Um, and that's the first people that came to Texas and they started growing the church there. Now there is, there are a lot of members in Texas. There's how many stakes? I believe there were like seven stakes in my mission. And in the Spanish work, there was only, in Spanish, I believe there was only, I think there was only two stakes or maybe three. I think there was only two stakes. Or, or I, actually, I think the, actually the Spanish only had, okay, I, let me correct myself. There were seven stakes, but there were only four Spanish wards within those stakes. That's that's correct. And there, there were a lot of branches, mostly branches in Spanish work. Um, but there were only four wards. I served in three of the four wards, and which was a huge blessing because everybody always wanted to serve in the wards because it's where you have, you know, more people, more member support, and all that, all that good stuff. So I served in three of the four, which I'm, I'm glad. I actually never served in the Fort Worth ward. Even though I went to the Fort Worth mission, never served in Fort Worth. I always served around Fort Worth, which I kind of called it. I, I, I told myself, I know that I'm never going to serve in Fort Worth. I don't know why. I just had a feeling, and I never did. And it's okay, because I loved every area that I served in. There's actually a good bit of, of members in, in Texas. You'd be surprised. They have a lot of a lot of support. Some of the strongest members I've ever met in my life are in Texas. And and maybe it's the fact that they live in Texas that makes them so strong. 
Maybe it's because they're constantly having to defend their faith from all these other, uh, all these other denominations and, and sects that are constantly attacking the church. There's a, uh, there's this big church in Denton in my first area. It was called Denton Bible. And it was actually a church that was started and founded by a former Latter-day Saint. And I remember hearing a story about how this Latter-day Saint somehow got himself, got uh, his hands on a pair of garments and he hung them up on the wall and of his church. And he kind of labeled everything, and it was a really, really bad. Um, one of the seventy who actually lives in in Denton, he he actually knows this guy, and he went and he had a talk with him, and I guess they resolved somehow, and he took him down. But you know, that's the kind of stuff that you have to deal with in Texas. People know about the Mormons, and they attack it. And it's something that you constantly have to live with every single day. People are constantly screaming at you. I remember riding my bikes almost daily. We would get someone, poke their head out their cars that were driving by and curse at us and yell at us terrible things. Things that I, I, would, I would just think to myself, how could they even say that? Like, even if you're not Mormon, you know? Um, another cool experience is, this one's kind of funny, we were in the college town in Denton, we were kind of biking down the road one day, me and my companion, and this random guy just pulls us over and he says, hey guys, are you guys wearing your magical undies today? So it's just experiences like that all the time. And you just kind of have to be prepared to, to be comfortable with the fact that what we believe is what we believe, and we don't have to be ashamed of it. We don't have to give an explanation for every question, but we do have to be ready to, to be firm in what we believe. And that's the thing about Texas. It's, it's, it's hostile at times towards the members of the church. I think before my mission, I did what most people do is I, I just trusted that these things were true, but I didn't really have the knowledge that they were true. I know I felt that the Book of Mormon was a good thing, and I could feel that it would never lead me astray, but I never really understood why or how or really anything about it. I had never read the, the full Book of Mormon before I went on a mission. Um, family scripture study wasn't... My mom tried, <laughs> but maybe because we didn't quite grow up with that those roots, it was very hard to, to get everyone to, to want to read or, you know, and I never went to seminary. My parents never really enforced it because it's just not a, it was almost like we didn't quite understand. Um, but my testimony was based on just good feelings, just I'm sure it'll be all right, that kind of mentality. Um, so... I went on my mission, you could say, really just um, just hoping, having faith that it was the right thing just because it felt right. Now, on my mission is whenever I, I feel like I gained a much stronger testimony. Because being in Texas, it's very Bible-oriented. There's a lot of Baptist, there's a lot of Methodist, there's a lot of Jehovah's Witness, and they have a lot of questions and I remember them asking me questions that I had never thought about and I thought whoa wait a second what am I doing like I don't even know what I'm teaching I'm just sharing what someone told me to share I need to find this stuff out for myself and I remember I started reading the Book of Mormon nonstop every chance I got I woke up in the morning and right after exercising while my companion was showering, I read the Book of Mormon. While I was eating breakfast, I read the Book of Mormon. During personal study, I read the Book of Mormon. During language study, I read the Book of Mormon. During lunch, right before I went to bed, when we were in the car driving, I just, I, I thirsted so much. I just wanted to know. I wanted to be able to look someone in the face and say that I knew that book was true. 
So I, I searched it more diligently than I've ever searched anything in my life. And I can't remember exactly when I knew, but I remember the feeling I got when I turned over that last page. I could look back in time and see a journey. When I, when I read the first page and I read the last page, I felt like a different person. So I never really, I never really heard a voice telling me this was true, but it was more like when I looked at myself and I saw the change it wrought in me just reading those pages from beginning to end, that is what convinced me. I thought this book surely is of God because it has the power to change people. And, and that's when I knew. I know that the Book of Mormon can change people's natures. It's not just a book full of words. It's a it's a inspired book that if if taken seriously can change a person's entire entire life if we will just let it. In my mission, uh, I think leadership was done a little bit different than other missions. I have a friend that he shared with me that zone leaders and district leaders were kind of chosen almost randomly in his mission, which was strange to me. You know, one day you could be a zone leader and the next day you could be a junior companion or vice versa, you know? And I was thinking, that's so strange to me because in my mission, it wasn't done like that at all. It almost felt like you earned it. Although you, I know you, you can't earn those kind of things. I know it's, it's, um, I know it's, it's inspired, but I always felt like I needed to earn some sort of advancement in my mission. And that's just kind of like a culture that was kind of created in my mission. Like, um, you, you could almost tell, you could, you could almost tell who was going to be the next district leader or zone leader because they were doing really well or they were just super positive all the time. So whenever I wasn't called, you know, transfers came up and I wasn't called to be a district leader. I always thought to myself, well, what am I doing wrong? What do I need to improve on so that I can kind of reach that level that I can be a district leader? And it's not that I wanted to be a leader. It's just that I, it almost felt like if I wasn't called to be a leader, maybe I was doing something wrong. And um, so I was always plagued with this, with this thoughts coming into my head saying, what am I doing wrong? And I think that's, maybe it's, maybe it's similar in other missions. I don't know. The reason I share this is because I know I have friends that it was very different. So coming to the Fort Worth mission, that's kind of how it was done. You know, the the really diligent and and righteous missionaries always seem to be the ones to go up in leadership so as time progressed i would often question what am i doing wrong and it it was kind of like a self-defeating feeling because i'd feel like well i'm never going to be a district leader or a zone leader so i just need to just you know it doesn't matter and i would just kind of stop trying so with time, I kind of learned that to be a leader, or, or more importantly, the best leaders are those that can lead without a title. You know, if you have a name tag or some sort of indicator saying that you're a leader, it's easy to be a leader because it's just expected. And I realized that if I wanted to be a leader. It was much better to be a leader without a without that kind of recognition. So whenever I started realizing this, I I stopped thinking about myself and I started just working hard and knowing that the best kind of leaders are those that don't think about themselves. They don't think about getting any sort of advancement and and naturally that's when it came. You know, almost instantly I realized, and this was a testimony to me, that almost instantly whenever I really just didn't care anymore about leadership is whenever the Lord made me a trainer or a district leader or a zone leader. Um, and I feel like that's almost like a challenge that is common in my mission because I would often talk to other 
other elders and sisters uh, who would feel the same way, who they would, they would be like, yeah, like, I'm never going to be a leader. I'm never going to do this. And, and I don't know if it just has something to do with my mission or if it's just a, a just a missionary thing in general, but I think that was one of the best lessons that I learned in my mission is that you don't need a title to be a leader. And then whenever you can realize that and really just be a leader, then the Lord will make you a leader. And because he needs leaders that you can trust. And and that's probably one of the things I would want every missionary going into Texas to know that there's no pressure to be a leader. You just have to go out there and be a good missionary and it'll come. I think a lot of people going into a Spanish speaking mission with people who are from a different country and a different culture are afraid to offend. You know, they're like, they're afraid to say certain things because they think, oh, they might take it the wrong way or, or something like that. But the truth is, is growing up as in a Hispanic family and then serving a mission in Spanish, the truth is, is that uh, to our culture, honesty is the best, the best way you could, you could talk to us. You know, it's, um, if you want to call them out, you can call them out. They can take it. I think that's, well, that's what I would tell, uh, uh, if I knew someone that was going into my mission, Spanish speaking, I would just tell them, you know what, just tell them whatever you want. Just whatever comes into your head, just say it. Um, because Hispanics don't really get offended when it comes to, to things like that. Uh, growing up in my family, like we, we would always, it's almost like you're very outspoken. You're very forward in what you say. There's no need to be afraid of offending anyone. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes people do get offended. It's, it's unavoidable. But the Hispanic culture is very, very forgiving. And it often turns out better, you know, that you did, that you were forward with them. So I think going as a, as a missionary into the field, like, if there are certain things that the people are doing that you know they're right, and you know they know, sorry, that you know they're wrong, and that you know that they know they're wrong, you can just call them out. Like, for instance, <laughs> drinking is a huge thing in Hispanic culture and smoking, uh, tobacco. So often people don't want to like address those issues because they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to offend them. I don't want to, I don't want to say that they have a problem, you know, with the Hispanic culture. You can just be straightforward and say, this is what the scriptures say, and you're doing it wrong. And Hispanics will appreciate that a lot more than if you try to beat around the bush. As far as preparing for a mission, I don't think I could have ever done anything to prepare for a mission. Like you can do many things, but you're never, I never really felt ready to go out. And I think that's just, maybe that's normal. I don't know if, if people always, if people ever get to that point where they're like, I'm ready to go into the MTC. I never felt ready. So, I mean, I'm sure there's other people that go into the MTC feeling like, I don't even know if I'm ready. The truth is, is maybe you're not, maybe you are, I don't know. But the, the important part is just taking that step anyways. Just going in faith because um, you don't have an, you, you really don't have any idea what you're going to go through. So you really, the only way you can be ready is if you're willing to, to do what it, what God commands. That's all that it takes. You don't need to know the whole, all the scriptures. You don't need to be the smartest, you know, pre-missionary out there. You just need to be willing and that's enough. Well, before my mission, I was dating someone very seriously. And I, I was actually attending BYU Idaho. And I thought, just like you, oh, well, we're going to get married after I come back. And I, had, I also had these very high expectations that if I went on my mission and served faithfully, the Lord would bless me with what I want. So that's also another thing that I feel very strongly about people preparing for their mission. I don't think there's anything wrong with having um, someone that you wish to be with after your mission. But I, 
I think there is something wrong when we expect certain things, when we set expectations that may not be realistic that we just don't know about. Because the truth is, as you go on your mission and you receive these experiences that you really never thought were possible, you, I felt things that I didn't even know I could feel. And I learned things that I didn't even know existed. And, and the truth is, is that now I'm back and things are different. And uh, things didn't quite go as, as I thought. So I think if I could have known that before my mission, I could have maybe enjoyed my preparation a little bit more because it was more it was more like sadness that I was leaving for two years instead of joy. So when it comes to relationships, I think they're good, but we shouldn't set our hearts solely on them, you know, set those expectations and expect God to deliver if we deliver. Does that make sense? So obedience is a big thing on the mission. You hear it preached to you all the time. Your mission president always says you need to be obedient, you need to be obedient. And it becomes almost like really annoying just hearing the same thing over and over and over again. Just obedience, obedience. And, you, and you're always like thinking, you know, I'm already doing good. Why can't you just be patient with me, you know? And it kind of, it feels like that. But I, I know it's really important to be obedient. And because it, when you're obedient, it doesn't only help you, it helps everyone around you. Uh, for instance, updating the area book is, uh, is a, it was a, I think it was a problem for me for a long time. I just, I got home at night and I, I was so tired. I was just so tired that I updating in the area book just did not seem fun. And often I wouldn't update it. I would just kind of go to bed and say, I'll do it tomorrow during like language study or something. Uh, and, and often I would forget and I wouldn't do it. But um, I remember this awesome experience I had that kind of taught me why we do that kind of stuff. Um, one day, me and my companion just didn't didn't really have anything to do. All our plans fell through, all our appointments canceled, and we were like, well, we have like three hours to fill. What do we do? I'm like, okay, well, let's look at the area book just to see what we find in there. And, and we just, we saw these names from like, I think they were from like six years ago. And we saw particularly one name. I don't know why we felt we should go visit this person, but it was recorded on there and there was a brief description. You know, they had previously accepted the missionaries, but for some reason they said they didn't want to see them anymore. So we, we go back to that house. This lady's name was Ermelinda and the area book, it looked like it wasn't quite, it looks like this, this particular member record, or I mean investigator record, wasn't done too well. So the address was kind of, it was hard to find. So we go and we show up. I think the house number was supposed to be like 821 or something like that. Or that's what the record said. And But there was no 821. We got there. There was an 823 and there was an 822, but there was no 821. And we were like, what? What is going on here? Like... Well, we drove all the way over here. Let's start knocking doors and start asking for this person. So we just started knocking random doors and knocked all the houses around. And um, there was no, no Air Melinda. So we started walking back to our car, maybe like 30 minutes later. And I remember there was one house in the corner that we didn't knock. And there was this huge, ginormous dog in front of the house. And it started barking at us like it wanted to kill us as soon as we walked by the house. And sure enough, we're like, okay, let's knock that door. And as we're walking, this dog is like menacing and trying to kill us. He's trying to eat us. Um, so we get around the dog and we knock the door. And this sweet little old lady opens the door and, and immediately starts crying. And we were just left speechless. I just look at my companion and I said, like with my eyes, I'm trying to ask like, what's going on? And this lady just starts crying and crying and crying and explains that the missionaries had stopped coming years ago and that ever since they stopped coming, her life just went downhill. Her husband had left her, 
her kids had left her, she was alone, she was thinking terrible things about ending her life, and but she always knew that one day the missionaries would come back and knock her door and and teach her the things that that she wanted to hear and she got baptized three weeks later um she's now like trying to get back in contact with her kids and trying to share the gospel with them she moved to mexico and is sharing the gospel over there strengthening saints over there and it was just incredible how you know the missionaries that updated that area book six years ago you know probably had no idea that this lady you know needed that needed the missionary six years later but because they were diligent on something that they just they never saw the effects of why they need to update the area book this lady could receive the the she could receive the gospel at the precise moment that she that she needed it and i think from that day on i never i never missed updating the area book because i always thought wow how many more air melindas are out there you know you just never know so i, I think that was probably one of my favorite experiences because I just, it was not just me, it was like a collection of all these missionaries who we all kind of worked together somehow in some way to get the gospel to her. So it was, it was a really cool experience. I have a really strong testimony on, on serving missions. I, you just never really know what kind of change can be, can come about through serving a mission. I remember at one point in my mission that I I thought to myself, why doesn't everyone go on a mission? Because what happens there is amazing. It is, it's true that it is the hardest thing that you will ever do up until that point in your life. You probably question every single day, what am I doing here? How am I gonna make it through the next day? You know, it's extremely, extremely hard. But the rewarding feeling of the spirit that comes is indescribable. I, I know that everything that I am up until this point in my life, I owe to my Heavenly Father and to the very fact that I served a mission. I am not ashamed ever to say that I served a mission because I know that it was the right thing to do. And it was the best thing to do. There is not anything else in this world that can ever replace those memories or those feelings. And for the rest of my life, I'm always going to be trying to, to recreate those feelings in my life, applying the things I learned to my mission. I learned that the church, though it may not be perfect in its members and in every every everything that goes on in the church the doctrines are perfect and this is the only place that all the doctrines of salvation can be found i know that it's all about change as we serve a mission we will feel change and that change is what's gonna keep us going from day to day I know these things with, with a surety, and I know that, that Christ has restored His church, and it does bear His name. And, and I'll leave these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.